All right, you guys can open to Romans 2. Romans chapter 2. And we're going to be in verses 17 through 29 this morning. So we're going to finish chapter 2 this morning. And as we get started, you'll notice the title of the sermon is The Gospel for Trolls. And that's, I don't mean the little figurines with the fuzzy hair that sticks up, not those trolls, but but I want you to think of for a minute, and we're going to see there's trolls in Paul's context here that we see evidence of in the book of Romans. But I want you to think about internet trolls with me for just a moment. We all know what internet trolls are, or probably, let's say most of us know what internet trolls are. So usually where they appear is when someone has put a a fairly harmless Facebook post or Twitter post up, and and this person decides to comment and to stir up controversy, to create some kind of conflict. A troll is someone who's just lurking, kind of watching, waiting for their moment when they can type some some words that would be troubling and kind of try to bait someone into a conflict of some kind. That, that would be a, a, a troll when it comes to the, the modern usage of the term and social media. And trolls are, are known for never really putting up their own content or seldom putting up their own content. They just want to cause problems with other people's content. So in Paul's day, trolling occurred as well. And it's not a new concept. It's a human kind of thing. And in Paul's day, there were trolls. There were people who were kind of lurking in the background, waiting for an opportunity to stir up controversy. Contrarians. And Paul in Romans, like so many of his other epistles, his letters, he anticipates that there are trolls in in the audience. and, And he knows that the trolls of his day tended to be religious fanatics, tended to be People like he was before Christ converted him. People who were adherents to Judaism, maybe they would say they believed in Jesus or they were following Christ's teaching, but yet they were holding on to the law in an unhealthy way that revealed their misunderstanding. And they were boasting in things like circumcision or religious rituals or rites, things like that, that they were emphasizing, which revealed that they weren't really understanding the essence of Christ's message. So Paul knew he had trolls in his audience. And I want you to to think about this this morning. Not only are there trolls out there, and there continue to be trolls out there, but there's also a troll within each one of us. There's this little voice that says, yes, it's about God and how great he is and all that he's done for me, his grace toward me. But it's also about me and my works and what I can do religiously to establish my own identity or to make my own sense of security or to to gain for myself what I value in life. And there are irreligious ways of doing that, that, and there are religious ways of doing that as well. There are sort of churchy ways of doing that. But it is our natural tendency to question the goodness of God as conveyed to us through the gospel. It's, our, it's in our DNA. It's, it's our fleshly, to use the biblical term, it's our fleshly mindset, the old Adamic nature, okay? And, and Paul knows that that's what, that's what manifests itself when the gospel is preached and taught. And, and what Paul does here in Romans chapter 2, in the section we're going to look at this morning, he's really continuing from what we looked at last week. What he continues to do is, is kind of beat the trolls at their own game. He, he baits them into a bit of a debate here. He assumes their way of thinking. He assumes their works focus. Not in order to validate it, but in order to expose the futility of a works perspective. In order to to expose the futility of when you and me and anyone else in this world hears the good news of God's grace and says, yeah, but there's something I can contribute to. I have my part. I have a way I can establish my identity through this or again, I can secure what I really want for myself by this religious practice or by works in one way or another. You don't probably notice it in, in your Bible, 
depending on what translation you have, but the word works comes up over and over and over again. This, this is the issue. This is human saying, I'm going to, instead of looking just to God and God alone, I'm going to look to myself for something of spiritual value. I'm going to try to justify myself or I'm going to try to manufacture spiritual life for myself by what I do, even by what I do in the name of God. That, that is Paul's kind of theology of works. And again, you might not notice it because the translations differ, but it, the word occurs in verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, verse 10, verse 15. This is what Paul is countering, is this works perspective. And if you didn't know that, you might think, and I'll show you a couple places that could be potentially misleading. You, you might think here that he's teaching a salvation by works. And I promise you we're going to read our text for this morning in just a minute. But this is all preliminary. This is all preparing us to go to our passage for today. But I want you to look back in the prior context at verse 7 for a moment. Chapter 2, verse 7. Because there are things Paul says that would almost seem to indicate that final justification or final salvation is determined by our works. Verse 7 says, To those who by persevering in doing good... And it's literally who persevere in working good, is the works term. Who seek for glory and honor and immortality or incorruptible things, the result would be eternal life in verse 7. So it seems like he's saying, hey, this is transactional. For those who do this the right way, they will be rewarded with eternal life. That's what it seems like he's saying. Then look at verse 13. For it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but doers of the law will be justified. Doers of the law will be justified. Hmm. Sounds pretty straightforward. So the ones that will be justified, determined to be right or righteous, are those who do the law. You see that? It seems like Paul is advocating, encouraging, prescribing works there. But what he's really doing is he is confronting the troll's in his audience, and the troll within us even today to say, hey, that part of you that questions, let's just assume that works perspective for a minute. How well does that work? Can that really secure life for you? Can that really justify you? Can that really establish you? And he'll show that it, that it absolutely cannot. The context bears out that it cannot. Paul is, is engaging in kind of a persuasive argument here to show the error of such thinking, to expose the futility of it. He's driving them toward this powerful gospel proclamation that comes later in chapter 3, which we'll look at toward the end of the message. But he's, he's really preparing them and preparing that part of us that doubts, that questions, that wonders. He's preparing them and us for the gospel to hear the good news of who God is, to be reminded of God's grace toward us, that everything from A to Z is covered by Him. That's a gift of His kindness to us. It's His kindness, as He points out earlier in chapter 2, that leads us or guides us to repentance, to turning back toward Him. That's what He's, that's what he's doing. Okay, all that said, let's read the passage, verses 17 through 29. He says, but if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law, but if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who, th- who though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. 
but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. As usual, as I finish reading there, I, I sense that there, it's wordy, it's dense. What Paul wrote here is, is meaty, theologically rich stuff, right? I get it. It's a lot here. But it's pretty simple. Basically, what he's saying is this. There's this human temptation to focus on works, on human achievement, and to make religion and the things of God just another way by which to do the same thing, by which people seek to justify themselves and to find life or ultimate fulfillment or ultimate satisfaction or ultimate security. That is what he's getting at. And he is confronting the, the trolls of his day and the trolls within us today. And I want, I want to show you in the text here, which again to me is, is pretty simple and straightforward when you break it down, but three characteristics, three characteristics of religious trolls, all right? And the, the first one is just pride, just straight up blatant pride. And we see this is in verse 17 through 20 where he starts with this idea of if you bear the name Jew, literally if you're, if you're called by the name Jew, and that's speaking of people obviously who, who, who are Jewish in terms of their ethnicity, and it also speaks of how they took pride in their pedigree and that they were historically oppressed, beaten down people. They had been through a lot, and so this was a badge of honor. They took pride in their being Jewish. It was their kind of sense of nationalism. And he said, hey, for those of you who take pride in this, this would be revealing of blinders to the gospel. Seeking to establish an identity for yourself. He says, if you rely upon the law, and boast in God. The idea of relying upon the law is, hey, you, you keep returning to law as your kind of foundation, as your, uh, some say it could be translated like your resting place. That's where you're comfortable. You're comfortable with the how you understand the law, which was this, this transactional thing of, if I do this, then I get this outcome. Kind of the, we talked about it in Sunday school this morning, but let's make a deal where you and God are kind of this negotiation going. He says, hey, th this, is, this is what characterizes blinders to the gospel is that part of you that says, well, if I can just manufacture a form of righteousness, I can control my life. And the Number one tool by which Jewish people did that was through the Mosaic Law. They misunderstood God's intent for it. They saw it as a means of justifying themselves, which was not ever God's design, and, and they continued on accordingly. So he says, if you bear the name Jew, you rely upon the law, you boast in God. This too could sound like a good thing. Well, what's wrong with boasting in God? Think of Luke 18 where Jesus tells this parable to those who, it says there in the Gospel of Luke, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. He tells this parable of two men went to the temple to pray. One is a tax collector, a scoundrel, the scum of the earth, all right? And the other one is this Pharisee, this religious guy who has everything on the outside all cleaned up and polished. And he goes into the temple and the Pharisee says, thank you God that I'm not like that guy and I'm, I do this and I do that. And he boasts in all his religiosity. Well, he, he invokes the name of God. In a sense, it sounds like he's boasting in God. He says, thank you God that I'm a good guy. So there is a way to boast in God that ironically betrays a complete and utter misunderstanding of what boasting in God in an accurate way or in a healthy way would look like. It's like this selfish, this religious approach. It just says, well, this is, hey, I, I'm, a, I'm a God guy. I'm one of these God people. I, I care about God. Boasting really in self in the name of boasting in God, that's just a cover. It, it says, uh, know, know his will in verse 18 and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law. This is the idea, hey, the, uh, this understanding of God. And I've studied my Bible. It's that idea. And I know the things of God better than the average person knows them. And, and I've been instructed out of the law. And the word essential there could be could be translated superior, the things that are worth more. I, I've dedicated my life to what matters more than the next person has. It's a, it's a religious superiority complex, really. It goes on. 
Verse 19, confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. So this, so this is that human craving. And, I, and I'm, I was thinking about this even as I reviewed my notes this morning, I, because I, I, I wonder how, how clearly or how obviously this would apply to you. For some of us, this is easily applicable. For myself, it's easy for me to understand what he's getting at here because I, in my past life and to this day, I still there's this constant temptation to just establish my identity based upon my ability to teach or to lead others or to counsel others or, or whatever. And what he's saying here is there's this human fleshly tendency to root your identity, to set as your foundation what you do, even in the name of God. And you can boast in the fact that you're this leader, this teacher. You're a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness. There is an extremely unhealthy version of that that is, ex that is also extremely common because it's extremely human. Paul is saying this is another one of those blinders to the essence of the gospel. It's taking the things of God, the, the truths even of Scripture. For the, for the Jewish person that day, it was the truths of the Old Testament. Today it would be all of the Bible. Taking the Bible and, and saying, well, this is, now, this is now a tool for me to, to establish an identity for myself. And, and let me just say a little bit more about how that can be enticing. If, if you're not someone who's ever viewed yourself as a spiritual leader, you don't even really aspire to such things, but yet you, you want to use this book to kind of control the family, to lead and guide, and, and yet, and, and maybe you hear this from the, your kids as they get older, the, the accusations of hypocrisy. Okay, so you're going to guide me, but look at your life. And you hear accusations like that. Why? Because if we look carefully enough, we can discover hypocrisy in all of us, even, even and especially as we establish ourselves as some kind of spiritual leader. So it can just take your average everyday form, or it can be the, the flavor I described earlier as someone who's a seminarian coming out of that realm where it's like, hey, this is now my way of establishing myself. I tried other things in the past. My personal testimony is studying in the business world and the finance and other things that I had tried and I, I just couldn't excel in the way that I wanted to excel. But man, but when I went off to Bible college and seminary for the first time in my life, I'm getting all A's. I'm like, hey, this is my place to shine here. And that is not at all the point of the gospel or the point of what Jesus is up to. It's just a sham. And Paul is exposing the sham in the midst of the Romans And as we said, the, the trolls he, he's confronting, it's the tendency to be inflated in our view of our own importance, to try to make it about the messenger versus the message. Remember Paul says, we have the excellency of this treasure, this good news of who our great God is. And he says, in what? In earthen vessels, clay pots. Pots that break, chipped, cracked humans. It's about the message. It's about who God is, not who, who these messengers are. And Paul, as a Pharisee, converted and humbled by Christ, understood that, and he understood this would be a temptation for people to boast in their own position, to even to hijack the things of God to be just another sphere in which they're seeking to establish an identity or prove something or silence the voices of the internal voices of contempt or self-loathing or the ideas that our lives don't measure up. Well, now it's gonna. Now my life's gonna matter because I'm part of this church or part of this mission or I've got this leadership position or I can be a leader or whatever. It's like you're missing the point because you're still in the works perspective, you're you're thinking you're gonna manufacture it and you're just gonna use religion to manufacture value. And the whole point of this book is that God is the one who is of value, and He is in pursuit of us to persuade us of that. to relieve us of the burden of having to establish our own identity, which is always a fool's errand.
A second characteristic of being a religious troll of one kind or another is hypocrisy. Verses 21 through 24, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? So here he says, look, you're telling other people, but you're not consistent. I mean, at best, we humans are inconsistent. At worst, we're just flagrant hypocrites. So he says, look, you boast in telling other people what to do. You teach them, but do you teach yourself? You preach that one should not steal, and yet you steal. You teach that people shouldn't commit adultery, and yet you commit adultery. You abhor idols, yet you rob temples. You, you, you have the same greed that you're constantly condemning. In our fallenness, it is our nature, apart from what God has done in our lives, that, that's what we've got. That's what we, we are all lawbreakers. So he's basically saying to a bunch of people who are gravitating to law, trying to use the Mosaic law as a way to prove themselves, he says, you're just picking and choosing. You don't even see your own hypocrisy. You're guilty. You're, it says in James, even to violate one law is to make yourself guilty of violating all of the law because it all stands together. It's all love God, love neighbor, and any violation shows your inability to do that. So so we humanly pick and choose, and we like to have these categories and make some things of more value in terms of how we are measuring righteousness versus other things, and we tend to give ourselves way too much credit. And the church even often is, is um, through messages of pastors and books out there, just sort of compelling us to do this, like, hey, get in there and compete. Do better than, you're, than you've been doing and compete with other people. And, and it just amounts to hypocrisy. I shared a few weeks ago from that book, Unchristian, where one of the main accusations, and this is not new, I remember hearing this years ago as a kid, that the, the biggest accusation against Christians, well, they're hypocrites. Well, well yeah, and, and if we understood Paul correctly, we would say, yeah, it's, it's nothing surprising about that. It's not about us. It's about the message, about who God is. So he says, yeah, you... You, you boast in teaching others, but yet you're, you're hypocrites. And I want to say, you know, Paul here, contextually, he keeps, he keeps speaking of this Jew-Gentile or Jew-Greek distinction. And in, in that culture at that time, as I said, the, the Jews would be the ones more apt to, to boast in their religion. And they were even trying to entice Gentiles into that, to kind of proselytize them into a Jewish perspective that was either completely devoid of Christ or at least making little of Christ. And there was this, just this constant temptation. But, but um, he also mentions not only that Jewish tendency to, to focus in an unhealthy or a mis to, to reveal a misunderstanding of the Mosaic law, there was also the, the Gentile notion of law. And, and I want you to understand, just for today's, as we think about today, the culture in which we live, it remains true. So, we, so we've got evangelicals in America sort of gravitating toward the Bible and viewing the Bible in a legalistic kind of way, which would be analogous to what the Jews of those days were doing. And then we have just the blatant pagan approach to life. And as I explained a little bit last week, that doesn't mean it's devoid of law. There's still law because this is what humans concoct. This is what we're drawn to. And so, for example, we just happened to be talking about it on the way to church this morning. I don't remember how it came up, um, but we were talking about the old John Lennon song, Imagine. Remember the song Imagine that the Beatles sang way back when? And I pulled it up on my phone here. So here are some of the lyrics. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living in peace. We we're talking to our kids, I think, about just the movement that's obvious to us culturally today and really nationally, globally, 
aiming at a utopia. And, and we brought up this example because Lenin wrote those lyrics many, many years ago and was singing about, well, hey, we could, if we could just get rid of religion, because look at all the historical atrocities done in the name of religion, and he's not wrong about that, by the way. But if we just get rid of that, then we could really establish peace. And a few years ago, I read an article by John Lennon's son, who said, my dad is a huge hypocrite. Destroyed our family with his arrogance. Here he is writing lyrics about world peace, but he's destroyed our family. So pick your form of law. Pick your form of human works, whether religious or irreligious or whatever kind. This is what we humans bring to the table. Pride, hypocrisy, Because we don't, because we're trying to manufacture, we're trying to create a form of life. But apart from God, there's only death. He is the one who is alive. Christ is life. In Christ, we find justification. In Christ, we find our identity. That's it. That's the only option. In Christ, there is peace. He is the hero. Of the story. We humans will perpetually reveal one way or another. We will reveal our hypocrisy. And not to say we should just then plunge into it. And go ahead and go for the gusto with it. And don't ever. Like it's good that we can be aware of that. And help sharpen and, and hold each other accountable in some of these ways. Not suggesting just some kind of reckless approach. But. But in terms of the stuff from which we're made, in terms of what makes us tick, in terms of what we believe and what we value, we are fully and utterly dependent upon God for life and for justification and for peace and for joy. It is a gift of grace. It is because of who He is. Not who we are or what we can do. The third characteristic here of religious trolls is externality or, or superficiality. Verses 25 through 29, this goes along with what I was saying earlier, we sort of arbitrarily pick what we want to boast in or what we want to focus on that we can feel good about. In their case, it was circumcision. It says, for indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law, that is, if you keep the whole thing. If you want to, if you want to boast in your circumcision and your obedience along those lines, you better keep the whole thing. But if you transgress the law, if you violate the law, then your circumcision has become uncircumcision. In other words, what value is it? And then he flips it around the other way. You could take a, a Gentile, an uncircumcised person, but if they were to keep the entire law, then wouldn't that equate to them having eternal life and being justified? It would. And that too, of course, is hypothetical. Ain't going to happen, but... His point is just to say, hey, you pick circumcision, this outward activity that you can do, that you can feel a sense of pride in, and Paul says You're, you've missed the whole point. You took something God intended to be just symbolic of the grace and favor you've been given in belonging to God, and you've made it some kind of badge of honor, and you've missed the point. So he says that he's not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. It's not about your ethnicity or your religious practices. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly in circumcision as that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. He says it's not about externals. It's not about the, the letter of the law, but the Spirit, he says in verse 29. It's similar to what he says in 2 Corinthians 3 where he says, we are servants of a new covenant which comes to us through Jesus Christ and faith in Him. And He says, in this new covenant, it's not of the letter but of the Spirit for the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. In other words, all the letter can do when you focus on the law or to use contemporary terms, when you focus on the Bible as some kind of rule book or a way to build an identity for yourself or to build a good family or to build a satisfying life or to fix your husband, 
wife, child, to fix the culture even. If you, if you focus on it as that sort of thing, all it will ever do is reveal that you are dead. The letter kills. The Spirit makes alive. And now we think of the embodiment of life that comes through Jesus Christ. Christmas time, right? He, he's born into this world. Life shows up and is granted to us as a gift of grace in that relationship, not us looking at some kind of law code and doing it in and of our own selves or by our own strength, but it is a gift of a person granted to us in relationship, union with Him, the Spirit granted to us, bonding us to God and giving us His life. And Paul says that is the essence of true Religion or true faith or true spirituality or true justification. And the praise is not from men, but from, from God. With, with the external focus, whether it's something like circumcision or just keeping religious rules, as I said earlier, it just becomes a, a way of sort of competing. And hey, if I can't beat other people in other spheres of life, I can at least beat them in my religiosity. And so I'll go really hard at that and feel good about my personal piety and how I sacrifice and how I care about things that matter. And, and it just becomes this competitive type of thing. And so, sure, maybe you get, this is what Jesus said to the Pharisees, hey, you basically you've got your reward. If that's what you're after, you've got your reward. When, you, when people praise you, when people admire you, when people say, wow, so-and-so is a great such-and-such, -such, that's... Uh, that's your reward. And just like everything else is dust. He says, but praise from God comes as we receive Him and rest in His promises and understand ourselves, begin to view Him as He is, to see Him for who He is and to experience life as a gift and spiritual life as a gift and justification as a gift and fruitfulness as a gift and all of it of grace. So as I said, this is the gospel for trolls. He, Paul is not just beating them up. Like I said earlier, he's, he's beating them at their own game and he is he sort of baited them into this thing, but, but he's doing that to lead them to the good news. And so let me just point us to Romans 3 verses 19 through 24. This is so good after he exposes the utter futility of a legalistic, works-oriented approach. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. This is what Paul is leading his readers to. This is what he's leading us to, is this other form of eternal life and justification, or I should say other approach. This is how it happens. God does it, and He does it through Christ's coming. It's different than everything else in life. Everything else in life is transactional. Everything else in life is conditional. If you're going to have any kind of benefit, you've got to put in the work. You've got to put in the effort. You, it's your blood, sweat, and tears that are going to get you any kind of achievement. Any kind of medals or badges or anything else that we deem of worth, it, it is by our own exertion. And, and this is entirely different. It is, it is dead people who have nothing, who bring nothing to the table, who Christ comes for and resurrects. It's Lazarus dead in the tomb, and Jesus says, Lazarus, get up. It's a gift. Christmas is a time of gift giving. You give gifts to people they didn't pay you for, you paid for, you went out, you, your effort. This is a gift, God's grace to us. I'll close with this thought. Um, 
because I because this is my profession, I'm aware of the different things that happen in the evangelical world out there. And some of you may have heard of this podcast. It's pretty popular. And I may be missing the, the timing of this. I know it came out like a year ago. I think it's still going or it's almost finished, but it's called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. And are you aware of that? Because Mars Hill, of course, the church in Seattle, big, big church, and Mark Driscoll is the pastor. And so this podcast is all about the details of what went on behind the scenes and how the church grew and became this enormous church with all these different satellite campuses and everything else and, and how it fell apart and crumbled years ago. And and it's really popular. And I, I don't want to say too much about it other than just, it was interesting to me. I heard one full episode and parts of other episodes, and a lot of it wasn't news to me. I kind of already knew some of the background details. But as I was listening to it, in one sense, it felt a little bit, um, for lack of a better term, gross, because it felt like it felt like gossipy in a way. And I'm not I'm not trying to impugn the motives of the people who put it together. It has its place. It's helpful in some ways. But just it just was about all the sordid details of things that were perverse and things that happened in the leadership and the, the culture of abuse that was there and toxic masculinity and stuff like that. That was These are the allegations regarding Mars Hill and how it, again, how it ended up growing like it did and then how it crumbled. And one of the things that was going through my mind as I was listening to it was, you know, why is it that these things are so shocking? Why is it that we, it's just shockwaves throughout the evangelical world and we're surprised and we're appalled and even that's part of what's compelling about the pie. It's like these little, de- these little salacious sort of details of what, and like, why are we so drawn to, why are we surprised by these things? Why, why are we so enamored with these leaders and, and, to one degree or another, we probably all are. If we've been a Christian for any length of time, there have been leaders we've looked up to. Like, why do, why do we keep falling for this, I guess, is what I'm getting at. It's just the same humanness. It's what Paul is addressing here in Romans 2. It's we, we love to either be that leader person or to admire that leader person. And there are countless distractions from the singularity and simplicity of who Jesus Christ our Savior is, who our God is. It's just so hard to see and be amazed by who God is. It's so hard to hear the gospel and not say, okay, yeah, that's really good, but what about, can we get on to some other stuff? Like, what about our mission? What about what we're going to do for God? What about this great calling we have? What about our opportunity here to seize the day and do this and do that? And Why can't we just say, wow, something about our nature? And so we have a good God who, through Scripture and even through life experiences and even through the rise and fall of a thing like Mars Hill, is saying, hey, guys, I'm the one who is of value. I'm your rescuer. I hold on to you. I have given you in Christ everything. You don't have to prove yourself. You, you, can, you, can, you don't have to be on the treadmill. You don't have to exhaust yourself trying to compete even with other Christians. Well, who's better at being a Christian whatever? Who knows the Bible better? Who sings better? Who does this better in the church context? I Really? Like, this is what we do. And here we have this God who's committed to saying, hey, it's not about you. It's not about him. It's not about her. I'm showing you who I am, showing you my glory. Just behold. Sunday school series, behold your God. And and that is where your healing comes from. Remember the Old Testament, the Israelites complaining, murmuring, because they were just preoccupied with life, just like we would have been if we were them. And God, not not because God is malicious in any way, but he sends these serpents to say, hey, these people need help to see me. And so there's these serpents come along, and now they're really freaked out, and people start getting bitten by these serpents, and it's venomous. And and then God has Moses craft this brazen, this bronze serpent to say, "You you just put that up, and when people look at it, they'll be healed. And Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And we look to Christ in whom we have healing and justification. And through Christ, there's nothing left to be proven. It's all been proven. 
There's nothing in there's nothing to boast in. There's nothing to boast in except God is gracious and merciful and kind and has given me life. And I don't even understand completely why he would do that, because that's so foreign to how I think and would operate. God in Christ has given us everything. And there are moments of clarity in which we can see that and we can be rejoiced. And there are lots of moments in which we don't. And what Paul is helping us see here is this, regardless of what we are even thinking in a given moment or feeling in a given moment, this is what is true. This is who Jesus is. This is the righteousness that's come running to you and draped itself around you in Christ and you have it. And this is the life that's just been given to you and you cannot, ready for this, you cannot screw it up. Even by dying. <laughs> Someday you will die. I will die. And scripture tells us over and over and over in a variety of different ways, even if we die, we will live. Because the life of God cannot be overtaken by the death of man. It cannot be. His life, Jesus, they put him to death and life just burst forth. You're not going to contain God. And he's the one who has you. And he has your life secure. And it's not you and what you can prove or what you can establish or what you can come up with a form. Like this is why we have such an aversion to it. It's not the letter. Well, the letter is good because I can formulate it. I can come up with a strategy. I can package it. And God is not packageable. <laughs> That's a word. His spirit, he gives us his spirit, he gives us life, he imparts to us everything, and he uses even the ups and downs of our lives to teach us of how good he's been to us through Christ. It's Paul's message back then, it's the same good news for today. And I hope that as we read these examples of religious trolls in their day, we can sense, oh yeah, that's, there's, there's that still going on in me in some ways. And God is good, and he loves me, and he's for me. He's rescued me, he is rescuing me, and he will rescue me. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for Romans 2. We read here another, another diagnosis of the human heart. And see how we are drawn to religiosity. variety of ways, countless ways really, that we are distracted and diverted from the simplicity of seeing, seeing you and your heart for us through Christ and your promises and your, the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you for arresting our attention in moments like these and helping us to know the truth which sets free. Thank you for littering our lives in this world with endless evidences of your kindness and provisions. Thank you for revealing the futility of religion, whether of a Judeo-Christian sort or a pagan sort, capital L law, lowercase l law, the human approach that can only result in death and awakening us to this completely other way <laughs> where you, sending Jesus, give to us life. Thank you for that gift. I pray for relief of burdens, Lord, as we reflect on these truths and sense the ways that we're drawn to trying to prove or establish ourselves, competing with others constantly, Help us to rest in Christ, his life. And we trust that as that happens, miraculously, there will be fruit of that in and through us, and you get all the glory and all the credit. And we have the sheer delight of belonging to you, being in a relationship with you, and knowing that you are up to 